Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Hobby Sauce. Today I have former master Patrick Zorro Allen who is going to be streaming this year's Masters and he's going to show you what it's going to look like on a game that we played on Universal Battle. Let's get saucy. Hobby Sauce. Pat, hey, thanks so much for coming today. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Um, tell us a little about yourself. I, don't, I, know, I, I know you, I've told you you're a US former master. Uh, the Masters, but tell us a little bit of, about the Masters and what yeah, that was. Yeah, so um, I qualified to play the Masters past uh, this year included the past three years, but I am stepping down this year okay. uh, in order to stream it. Um, since you know it's a little bit closer to home this year, as yeah. in San Antonio, so go, we're going to be streaming at top three tables. And by top three, I don't mean always the top three people, but just table numbers wise, the top three. And we'll be, it's gonna be one stream, but we're gonna be jumping back and forth. If you're ever familiar with NFL Red Zone, yeah. that's the style we're gonna go on. We have ESPN for the Kings of War US Masters Tournament. This is so cool, I'm excited, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And you know, today we, I just wanted to show people kind of a little taste of what we'll be doing. And hopefully some people will tune in. Sweet, man. So we're gonna get into it, but we, uh, there's a tournament coming up next week. Um, it might have actually already happened by the time I get this video out, but it's called Shiloh Slaughter. It's the first GT of the year. We're using our Shiloh lists, or what he would take to Shiloh, and we're gonna be playing that today using the Masters um, streaming that you're gonna be doing. So you'll, I'm actually not gonna be much in this video. We have uh, two commentators, two commentators uh, Matt Carmack and Michael Piercy. Okay, cool. Um, I hate my voice, so I'm actually not gonna be commenting in the Masters. <laughs> I am going to be running the graphics and the actual uh, production of the show. Okay, okay. So Pat's just the, the talent here. He's not. Uh, I'm not the talent. No, excuse uh, me, I, you're not the talent. Yeah. <laughs> Pat's not the talent. Pat is the brains of the operation. Exactly. That works. You have, you have, um, some background in film too, correct? Yes, yeah, as I work uh, as freelance in the television, film, and broadcasting. You can IMDb this guy. I have. He's on there. So this should be pretty decent quality. I was impressed with what I saw on here. So without too much further ado, we're going to go ahead and show you on Universal Battle what it would be like. Now, just keep in mind that we have to play on Universal Battle to do this. But when you have the whole setup, it's actually going to be over the table. You're going to be seeing it in live action with the actual models people are going to be playing. The last game, it's going to be the top three tables. And before that, y'all are just going to do whatever tables the, people the, want to see. Yeah, the most interesting matchups. Yeah. And we're, we're uh, before every Masters, we usually have our matchup cast video. Mm -hmm. um, as we go over those matchup casts, we're actually going to have a poll on which of the three tables you want in the first round. Awesome. All right, guys, uh, we're going to show you. Let's get to it. Welcome to Hobby Sauce. This battle report is brought to you by the U.S. Master Stream, which is going to be live on February 23rd and 24th on Tabletop Titans Media, which you can find a link to in the description down below. I'm Matt Carmack, and with me today is going to be Michael Piercy. Let's get saucy. All right, so we've got uh, we've got Pat Allen against uh, Matt Young. It's going to be Abyssals against Ogres here. Matt's Ogres, he's got a couple hordes of the Siege Breakers. That'll be a nice, uh, nice solid main line for him. Uh, supported by a couple hordes of Boomers, one with the Fire Oil. Some Red Goblin Scout Chaff. A, uh, a horde of Chariots with Pathfinder. A Chariot Mounted Army Standard Bearer. Two Warlocks. Uh, those are really nice. They're going to get the uh, the bonus dice the same way the, the Orc Warlocks do. Uh, both with Drain Life. One of those has the Banner of the Griffin. An Inspiring Boomer Sergeant. A couple of the amazing new uh, new Mammoths. Ghost Rider. And Namargarak, the special character that will be giving out Vicious to all of his melee attacks for his units. Uh, over on the Abyssal side, Pat's bringing the Unleash the Hounds formation. He'll have a regiment of Abyssal Horsemen with Nimble. A couple of Hellhound troops. The Helquin Blood Mask of the formation has the Blade of Slashing. Two hordes of Molochs, one of which has the Healing Brew. Two of the new Cronius uh, with the increased attacks. Uh, those are going to be really nice, doing AOE damage to everything around them. A couple of Flame Bearer Regiments. A Succubi Lurker Regiment with the Hammer of the Measured Force. A Harbinger with the Loot of Insatiable Darkness for Bane Chant mounted. And then three Abyssal Warlocks with a, an array of spells. We got Fireball 10 on one of them, Alchemist Curse on another, and then Drain Life, Weakness, and Inspiring on the third. Well, it looks like Matt won the roll-off to go first for deployment. And so and he's dropping a Siege Breakers down here in the center. Scenario for this game, loot. So he's looking to claim those two that are further to the right and just hold them all game. It's interesting that uh, nobody was willing to gamble on that token on the right-hand side. 
it was definitely an option to put it behind that wall of houses, but then you're gambling on whether or not you end up on that side of the board or not. Yeah, that is that is definitely definitely something you can do. Especially with what Matt's brought to the table. He doesn't have the ability to maneuver around if he gets stuck on the wrong side of the board, so I don't know if he wanted to try that. Yeah, he does have some uh, some bigger templates, especially with the chariots there. They are going to benefit nicely from this uh, this big forest, and then looks like a small field on the left hand side of his siege breakers. If he decides mm -hmm. to put in there, um, I think that'll be a really nice nice alleyway for them. I'm sure that uh, the pet's expecting them to go there as well, just based on their um, the amount of open area they'd have to play with. Yeah, I was going to say those chariots have Pathfinder, right? So they can. They do, uh, yes. Yeah, that whole alleyway is just wide open. That's crazy. So on Pat's side, looks like that he's setting up to try to slow burn grind in the middle. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If if he is able to deal with those chariots, the flame bearers taking that pond in the middle are going to be tough to dig out. Um, yeah. They have pretty good nerve for, for their stat line, and, and they will just be putting down a hail of fire for anything coming in there. Um, but, I mean, if you any, if anything is going to go up against them head-on, Siege Breakers are not bad for that. Yeah, and with the new Cronius on top of that, that being able to deal wounds every turn to stuff at the beginning of the activation, that will actually start eating away at those Siege Breakers. Their nerve isn't super crazy, it's just that defense, and the ability to do auto wounds is really strong right here. Definitely. It's interesting with both of the mammoths in front of them like that as well. Uh, that's going to just hit like a train coming out of the woods there. Yeah. It's okay. They don't have Strider, so <laughs> I don't think they're going to hit as bad. I do like what Pat's doing on his flanks here. He's got the hounds on either far side, and then I believe those are Heliquins? Uh, those are the uh, those are the abyssal horsemen. It's a part of the formation, the Alicia Hounds formation. So they'll get vicious as well as the dogs and the Heliquin itself. Uh, so some some pretty pretty strong speed coming around the right side there. It looks like the uh, the dogs on the left hand side have uh, their work cut out for them trying to grab that token against uh, a unit of similar kind of chaffy cavalry. We've got the the chariot army standard, and it looks like now both mammoths are pointing in that direction as well. I think in the long run, those mammoths are going to actually swing around back toward the center. Because um, there's just not really, like, the dogs will not, wouldn't beat a single mammoth, let alone two. So I think that's a long ploy. Right. And, and looking at this, it's it's easy to look at that and think that that's maybe an overcommitment to that side. But in loot, it's it's very different because those objectives are a third of the potential points in the game. So securing yeah. one early being able to swing the left side of the board like that um, is, is very strong if he's able to pull it off quickly. Especially because if he can grab it with the, the champion in the back, he can just run that behind all his stuff, and then he can he can just swing that flank down to the center hard, and he won't even need to worry about guarding the token. Right, and especially with the, um, the setup that Pat has on the right-hand side, mm -hmm. um, that one's going to be very difficult to dig out. So it looks like Matt here wants to secure the left-hand side and make the game, you know, a battle over the center center objective. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see if Pat tries to go all the way around those buildings on his left flank, Matt's right flank, or if he tries to come in a little closer to the center. But he's already pushing forward really hard over here. It looks like Matt's center did not move at all. Um, yeah. Interesting strategy there. He does need to worry about the speed swinging around the right-hand side and the shooting in the center, so I can see why he would want to hang back a little bit and see how things develop. Are there two Cronuses in Pat's list, or is it just one? There are two. There's one in the center there that's on the right-hand side from our view of those flame bearers. The other is to the right-hand side of the lurkers that just came out of the woods. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I don't think that... I don't necessarily agree with Matt's play to stand still in this instance. He needs to hold the center. He's not going to get much of a benefit out of charging straight. So, Yeah, I think that if anything, a little bit of a push from the left siege breakers and left boomers, mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to grab a little bit, of, a little bit more of the board uh, would have been helpful. 
the ones on the right hand side are kind of stuck waiting to see where the cavalry go which mm-hmm. side around the house they go um and not being able to see any of the infantry over that hill definitely doesn't give them a strong impetus to push forward their their threat projection is pretty small um until they can crest that hill i was like this is a clash 19 game they can't just touch the hill so well they're not hack three anyway but and yeah we we do need to keep in mind that that while this is clash 19 masters is going to be playing at clash 18 yes so so that'll be some some interesting differences for those that are that are planning ahead to uh to play in the Masters, to view the Masters, uh, we need to keep in mind those old uh, Clash 18, Clash 19 differences. Yeah. Crony says, you'd only have one on the table, and they would not be at all like this. So, very different unit now. Incredibly different unit now. So it looks like Pat on that on that left side has uh, swung over one of the Warlocks. I'm not sure which spell that one has. Uh, I think that it's actually the uh, the fireball warlock, um, and then one of his mountain units. I believe that's the blood mask. Is that correct? It's the yes, the helicon blood mask. And now that's enough that maybe it's going to be interesting to see how those mammoths want to come out from behind those buildings because both all those characters are individual. They're not actually on. They're unlike most large infantry characters, which do not get individual. These ones do, so they can spin around on an axis and just go wherever the heck they want. So in this case, I don't actually know if he wants to try to come around because he won't be able to catch those characters very easily. It's it's interesting because the definitely you know that's not enough on Pat's side of things to to win that side of the board. Um, but if it's enough to delay, then that would be a win for Pat because. Matt has devoted those two mammoths in that direction as of right now. He needs to grab that objective and secure that side of the board quickly before the stuff in the center gets threatened too much too much more. Yeah, because I'm just looking at the center here, and that buildup is crazy from Pat. There's just so much stuff coming down the center of the table, and it's yeah. all scary. <laughs> Yeah, and it does look like Matt is starting to see that he needs some more support on that side as he brings one of the mammoths back toward the center of the table. <clears throat> Careful positioning behind those those buildings was was very smart. It let him be more flexible instead of committing them forward too much more. They wouldn't have been able to swing back to the center that easily, at least the one that did. Yeah, no, I I, I do like bringing one back to the center. That was definitely needed. Um, without that, he had no real. Pack can just keep on advancing forward without that. The one horde of chariots is scary, but it has to. It it has to. It'll kill one thing, whatever it touches, but then it's going to get stuck. And there's a lot of things that'll that'll take it out in return. And I think he needs at least one more thing to go in and support for when these two lines actually hit in the center. Exactly, and without without much shooting outside of the the magic to scare those Molochs, you definitely have to be afraid of that second line. Oof. There's a chunk, speaking of, hitting on the flame bears on the left. Definitely a potent shot there. I'm not sure which of the Warlocks has the inspiring. I imagine it's the one in the center of the formation, the, the rightmost Warlock. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to tell from this angle whether or not those those flame bearers are going to be within inspiring range. Looks yeah. like a couple points of damage onto the uh, the dogs on the left-hand side from, from that mammoth. And really, as soon as those are gone, that side of the board becomes much, much safer for... Uh, for Matt to push forward and secure that objective. Yeah. With with yeah. one mammoth running up and grabbing a token, even with the spells and the uh, the cav character, it'll be difficult to really get that off of that mammoth before the end of the game. It comes to mind, how much long-range shooting does Matt actually have? Because he that was a lot of damage for one round. Uh, so. He does have the two ballista from the two mammoths. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are going to be shooting uh, two shots hitting on fives, uh, he is able to move and shoot with that without penalty. Mm-hmm. Uh, D3, D3 damage per hit with piercing two. 
Oof. And then he's got some fire bolts with piercing one from Namagarak, who's there between the chariot horde. And then gotcha. really the, the scariest bit of the shooting is going to be the, the warlocks together. Their lightning bolt currently is being buffed by four hordes. Uh, so that gives each of them lightning bolts seven right now. Oof. I'm I'm actually a little bit concerned then because Pat's so that I mean, that forces Pat to close this and, and that actually brings makes this a little bit more. Th- this brings a lot of the decisions that Matt has made so far in this game into light, where he's been very slow at approaching the center because he he can force Pat to make the commitment to come forward. Because I don't think Pat has quite that much long range firepower to throw at. Got good short range, but not as much long range. The 18 inches from the flame bearers, you should be able to capitalize on that outside of the first turn. Um, you should be able to get some some good shooting. It looks like we're into his second turn here on the bottom of the turn, so we should see some uh, some of that fire coming through. Yeah. Doesn't look like the flame bearers were taken off the table on that turn, so that's really great for Pat's ability to put pressure with his shooting. Yeah, it doesn't look like they were wavered either as far as, far as I can tell, so we'll see. It's going to be interesting. He's got a lot of targets, too. So. so it looks like the Warlock there with the green marker on it has been weakened uh, by one of the Warlocks from, from Pat's side of things. Um, so that'll definitely take some of the edge off of that lightning bolt shooting. It's just a fiery lightning bolt now. And that was an alchemist curse from that middle warlock. It looks like it only did a couple of damage, but that's a great, great uh, target straight to the front of siege breakers for, for Pat there. Oh yeah. I was say, especially now that's the Cl- uh, clash 19 alchemist curse, you're getting the 10 dice, I believe, or is it 12 dice? It's a, uh, yeah, it'll be 10 dice, 10 dice hitting on fours and then wounding on anything but sixes. Oof. So, we got getting the, some heals the, off. The flame bear is putting some shots now. It looks like trying to pop that warlock. Any or... other? Yeah. Ooh. See. Yeah, I was like, that may be enough to get a lucky waiver on the Warlock. The Siege Breakers, I don't expect we'll, we'll see anything happen there. But you never know. Five damage on them. Their base is going to be a 15-17 nerve. Mm-hmm. I believe they're under the banner of the Griffin at the moment, so they'll be a 16-18. An 11 would waiver them. Not a, you know, not a high percentage roll, but it's definitely possible. I don't know... Oh, looks like uh, Matt has moved up his forces on the left hand side of the board. I think that that standard bear has actually prevented those dogs from being able to get past him in either direction. So that's a great play for Matt there. Yeah, it's going to force him to either commit to the front or just go home packing at this point, because there is not a whole lot that he can do about that side of the board. That is just a standard bear, though. So the dogs to the front, if they get some assistance from that, uh, from the blood mask, can really do some damage. That is true. So, and on the right, we are seeing those calves start to swing around. Yeah, the Matt's boomer horde. turning the boomer horde to shoot them. Boomer horde and one of the warlocks. It looks like. Oh. Oh. Maybe think. Maybe rethinking that warlock commitment. Okay, so it looks like Matt is debating throwing the chariots in here. Trying to see what options he has. And ooh, he is going to try charging that warlock. So it's interesting the angle he was going on. Looks like they've corrected it there now, but with that warlock being an individual, uh, that actually makes it a little safer because the, the warlock will have to align to the chariots, preventing them from exposing their flank so severely as if it was a large infantry character. Yeah, no, and that's that's going to make it interesting for Pat to have to deal with that next turn because I'm 90% sure those Molochs are out of range, and that's really the only unit 
that was quite in range to hit it from where they are. It's surprising how how tight he brought up that mammoth behind the chariots because they are going to be pretty limited on their reposition options, assuming that they do, which they should, take out that warlock. Yes. Yeah. I I imagine he's not going to change their facing too much. The Molochs can't really come forward without being threatened by the Siege Breakers. Um, He does have that Cronius still, and that's going to be interesting to see how he deals with that right now. Because that, I think, is going to throw a wrench in the plans. And there's right. that ever-present threat of the, the succubus right on the other side of the hill. It looks like we've got some shooting, though, going through onto those uh, onto those lurkers right now. A couple damage to get them started. Mm-hmm. Looked like the Siege Breakers got healed a tiny bit. We've got a Boomer Horde shot onto the Horseman there, and that Oof. is a huge, huge shot. Looks yeah, like that... they had a Bane Chant there, because that three went through for damage, so they must have hit a Bane Chant doing ten damage in the one shot. That's devastating. Jesus. Oof. Oh, and there goes past Flanking Force on the right-hand side. That that definitely hurts. I'm actually really curious if the way it's set up, if those dogs can hit the flank of the Siege Breakers. They may not be able to see them, though. I don't know that they would fit there past the boomers. Yeah, it would be interesting. Um, Regardless, they don't have Pathfinder, so I don't know that that would be a huge benefit. Very, right now. very strong play, correct? Yeah, that that's definitely going to change this up a bit. So. So it looks like the chariots actually were able to get a good reposition after taking out that uh, that warlock. I imagine that right now they're still out of range of the Molochs, which sets them up in a very good position facing into the center here. Yeah. The flamblers on the flank probably won't do anything, so he's not really worried about that. They'd be better shooting it anyway. But Back it looks the... like Pat is committing over here on his left to taking out that chariot standard bearer and he took the warlock completely away from the scouts it's an interesting decision possibly protects them a little bit from taking some more damage but now you have to worry about that troop of scouts coming around the side and while they are goblins um, you definitely don't want to give a flank or a rear to anything that can uh, come into support and not an additional charge right something you don't want to have to worry about later on in the game it does look like Pat is pulling the trigger and throwing in the Croniuses. Uh, one of them getting to deal a wound to Magamac, I want to say. Uh, I think that's actually going to be one of the uh, the Ogre Warlocks. Oh, um, yes, it is. Yeah, Namagrak is there over on the left Siding in the, the red, yes. uh, below the Chariot Horde. Uh, correction, it looks like Demarcrack is between the uh, the Ogre Hordes and the one in the red there is going to be the Boomer Sergeant. So, but now that Warlock, yeah, oof. That Warlock's going to get it. That Warlock uh, might not have the best day from here on out facing down a horde of Molochs. But Pat is slow, like, yeah, this is, this is going to be an interesting turn because he's trying to, I think what he's trying to do there is block the chariots and force them to go into the Cronius if they want to take any charge. So at this point, if the Molochs for some reason do not pop that Warlock, or even if they do pop that Warlock, that they're still able to do whatever they want on the next turn. Oh, wow. It looks like the Flame Bears have recovered quite a few of their wounds using their regen. That's it's going to be pretty big, as they have a pretty decent nerve to begin with overall. That, I would call that a an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Yeah, it's better like than they, better they than were half. ten wounds one point in this game, weren't they? Down to three. But you definitely get the feeling here with with Pat pushing forward so aggressively that losing that flanking force of cavalry has kind of pushed up the clock for Pat to to 
really get something going in the center of the board. Oh, yeah. The dogs having to commit into the boomers, I don't think, is what he at all wanted to have to do over there. So, But it gives, I mean, it will at least hold that unit up and force it to commit into the dogs since they won't be able to shoot next turn and they won't be able to turn. The, they'll, they won't be able to shoot assuming that those dogs are able to do Deal some damage while hindered into the boomers. Situationally, I think it'll end up being the same. There, it, there aren't many other options for the boomers to shoot at, even if they aren't disordered. Mm -hmm. He could always take a 180 pivot, giving his rear to the dogs, uh, but he doesn't really have many shooting options to make that worthwhile over there. Right. Yeah, it'll it'll hold him up for a good bit, or at least at least one more round. And and Pat is definitely paying for rounds right now. So. Getting into combat here, looks like we've got a good number of damage coming through onto this standard bear, seven damage. Oof. But Doesn't look like, like he was able to get the kill. Not even a waiver there from... Yeah, that was a tough, tough little BSB. Well, it appears the BSB was wavered. Oh, that's quite a difference. One wound from the Cronius to the Siege Breakers. That is not what you're looking for. Those Siege Breakers <laughs> hit like a train on the way back in. And the Siege um, Breakers have taken an Alchemist Cursed and a Cronius, and they are they are smiling. But but as predicted, that Warlock is is he is not smiling. It looks like actually that Cronius was able to pull a waiver off on the Siege Breakers on the left hand side there. So that'll that'll possibly keep him alive a little longer. It's difficult to tell whether the uh, the chariots or maybe even the mammoth, depending on positioning, can get into uh, the flank of that Cronius. Yeah, with with how everything's set up, I I feel the chariots can sneak in there. Just really barely. though, really though, I think. Pat's probably just fine with that, with the Molochs in position to to capitalize on anything that, that happens after the Cronius goes down. Oh yeah, because the Chariots, they, they will have no reform options if they do that. Like it, They would be a terrible repositioning situation. And then that's the, in the best case scenario. And so, but looks like on the left he's gonna see if he can squeeze in. Yeah, yeah he can. So the mammoths go in to try and try and deal with that uh that troop of dogs there. That would all but lock up that side of the board. I don't believe that the Heliquin Blood Mask is really going to be able to take down a mammoth on its own. He's got three attacks. He would need uh, quite a few turns to get that done. It does look like Matt is going to take the bait and go after the Cronius here. So that chariot unit is big and in the way of everything. At this point, he was he didn't have many options for the Chariot Horde, so if you're going to commit him, uh, picking up a Cronius, potentially, and then blocking up most of the shooting from Pat while he has to clean up the Chariot Horde is probably his best bet at this point. Yeah. It is becoming apparent on the right that that second Cronius is actually pretty key right now because that unit of Siege Breakers is going to get stuck in for a little bit. And in the meantime, that's allowed the Succubus to finally clear that hill and become relevant in this game. <laughs> now, that's an interesting decision uh, from Pat because he could just have taken them and run them away. Probably would have taken some shots until they got to the woods. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that he would have been able to, barring a very lucky shooting roll, get them out, uh, out of harm's way and make it just a fight over the center of the board. They do provide a lot of assistance in combat. But exposing them to danger at this point, there's a lot of shooting that can still reach them right now. Yeah, I am a little bit concerned about how much damage. Yeah, the boomer horde, there it goes. Amazingly, only one it looks like, and it looks like they're fine. And the stealthy for sure will help keep them alive. So, let's see, here comes the flank coming through with 48, da 48 attacks from the flank of the chariot horde. And that will do it for the Cronius. I don't think many people would be surprised. That was that was 
an incredible amount of damage for it's one unit to very take. Very high percentage attacks to come through. Yep. There's not much in the game that can take a flank from a horde of ogre chariots. And over on the left-hand side, looks like the mammoth has done its job in taking care of those dogs. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty safe loot token over there on the left-hand side for Matt at this point. Yeah, an unwounded mammoth with a BSB and support right next to it. That's going to have to have some really hot rolls to get that token back, if if even. The second Cronius is taking a beating from the Siege Breakers. But it doesn't look like he was able to live. take him out. So but the Boomers like are freed up for the next turn. Yes. Did look like the Cronius was wavered, but has Fury, maybe? Uh, yeah, he will have Fury. Everything there will have Fury, but it looks like right, he's right. actually considering moving him to another combat, so he must have gotten out Ooh. of there clean from the previous combat there. He's going to say he's going to... Some stuff's going to burn. Yeah, that'll that'll trigger that uh, Cronius ability. One damage for everything, every enemy unit within six inches when it's given an order. And then that's allowed these succubi to come in on the siege breakers and with the hammer of measured force, that unit might be just enough to take out those siege breakers. That's definitely that's that's a great unit for them to go into with that item. Twenty uh, five attacks. attacks. Twenty five attacks on twenty five attacks. Yep. Oof. Yeah, that that'll do it. So, interestingly, here Pat's putting the Molochs into the front of the Siege Breakers. I'm not sure positionally which flank he was in of the Chariot Horde. I think in this case, it's the Siege Breakers are actually the bigger threat because the Chariot Horde, while big and scary, is now kind of stuck in a position where it can't do anything for the next turn. Like it can, it can run over those flame bearers, no problem, but that's all it can do. So he might just be relying on, yeah, stalling it up. And then, oh, no, he's going to bring in the Molochs. There we go. That makes sense. Now, they don't, they, they are going to be hitting on fives in that combat, though. Yeah. So the chariots, the chariots may very well live through this. Flame bearers hitting on sixes. And the Molochs hitting on fives. Yeah, I don't know if I fully agree with bringing in the, the Molochs in on that charge. I think it would have been best to just let the Chariots run over a unit of Flame Bearers, and then he could have positioned it such a way that the Chariots couldn't reform, and he could have gotten a flank, and that would have deleted it and removed it from the game. But Interestingly, as we finish with the movement and go into the shooting, it looks like uh, that other Flame Bear Regiment was wavered in the previous turn. So there probably won't be much outside of a couple of Warlocks that, that Pat has in the shooting phase here. Yeah, it's it's <clears throat> it's starting to get bloody. It's starting to get good, and units are get falling. Stuff is burning. It looks Ooh. like uh, we've got a drain life coming through onto the chariots here. That will definitely help the the chances of taking them off the board. That's Michael's favorite spell right now. <laughs> Doesn't actually look like it did much to them. It didn't do anything to them, so Oof. that was fortunate for Matt there. And then yeah, the Fireball fine. Warlock on the left-hand side there is going to go in and uh, burn some scouts. Yeah. He did manage to get a Bane Chant off on the Molochs fighting the Siege Breakers, though, so that unit may be able to come through. And Looks like the scouts uh, got pretty lucky over there. Red goblins are maybe more lucky than, than green goblins. Only taking two <laughs> wounds from the fireball. It they seem to be just like... fine. But the army standard bear that was supporting the left-hand side is now gone. Again, probably a little too little too late on that side for Pat, as the mammoth is going to be just very, very difficult to shift. Oh, yeah. So it does, it does look like those Molochs did bounce off the chariots. Two five kind of... wounds to them. Yeah, kind of unsurprising. Difficult terrain hurts hitting on fours so much. So, but let's see if he can break these siege breakers. So, oof. This is a this is a big one here. So, six wounds from the Molochs going into those siege breakers and it looks like they're going to live as well. This could Maybe. be devastating if if Matt can pick up both of these Moloch words here, which is possible. Do you, did the siege breakers get wavered? Do we know? I 
because Banner. Thank, thanks, thanks to the Banner of the Griffin, it looks like they actually were just fine. So, but it does look like the Hammer of Measured Force came through. It definitely did, but I I still feel like they're not in the best position. Those those lurkers with all the magic that's nearby, the boomer horde that's there, they could be in some trouble. Yeah, with the with the siege breakers able to go back into the Molochs, he can just turn all his shooting, and at this point, he might actually be able to pick them up. So so yeah, I'd be worried about losing the Molochs in the water, possibly the other Molochs if the siege breakers roll hot, and and the lurkers as well. Uh, looks like the Cronius was not able to kill the Boomers on the right-hand side either. Ooh. So with 12 damage on it, if the Boomers are able to... Come back in? Yeah. If they can pick up that Cronius, that's going to be in a very tough spot here. Oh, and it looks like the Scouts were able to get a flank charge onto those Molochs as well. Looks like they did have to tow into the water for that, so it's not going to be quite as effective, but Defense 4 on the Molochs and a couple more damage from that with the chariots in the front could do it for them. Yeah, when you throw in Brutal for the Ogres as a special rule for just all their units, that's it's not great odds for the Molochs right now. Even without Thunders on those chariots. I will say, we're in the top of turn 5 here. Matt will have this turn, one, one next turn, possibly a second turn after that. And the flame bearers are totally healthy and sitting on that center token. Yeah, that's that. I was actually getting really curious as to what turn we were in because if Pack can just hold on to those two tokens, then he can win it. So positioningly, his characters might be enough to do it. But there's so much shooting left in Matt's list, and so much of it has the range and height. Because now that that mammoth has finally come around, his ballista can start picking off taking pot shots, and he only needs a couple more wounds on that succubi unit to actually start threatening it. So, so interestingly here, it looks like those uh, the ogres there that had the damage coming off of them, were they're being healed. They didn't go back into fight. I'm wondering if the, uh, the banner of the griffin wasn't taken into account on that nerve roll. Possibly was at a range, or maybe it was forgotten about because a 15 should not have actually wavered them. But they are backing off for now. Looks like they were treated as wavered. Yeah, everything else is is kind of it's not too many fancy fancy moves going on. Most of everything's kind of stuck in. I do see the mammoth taking pot shots at the flame bearers, presumably. Looks like he got. Another waiver on that same unit. That unit yeah, that did. has taken 10 wounds, gone down to 3, back up to 7. Oof. Oh, and the succubi go down. Yeah. It's yeah. Just too, much, too much shooting on that side of the board still remaining. So that loot token is now up for grabs. And Pet does not really have much left to go grab it, unfortunately. Oh, and a snake eyes on the Cronius. So that, that actually gives Pat a little bit of life. If they can pick up the boomers on that side of the board, swing back around, they're hurting pretty badly, so the shooting will be a factor again. But he does have a unit over there that could potentially free itself up to go grab that token at the end game. It is worth noting that because this is Ogres we're having to talk about, that M Matt just has so many units that can pick up the tokens, like all of those characters down there are capable of grabbing that one loot token, and I don't think Pat has enough stuff to block them all. It's going to be like maybe maybe he can just barely cover everything, but if he can sneak through yank that token, get it out of there with the Cronius, that might be enough to score on the win, but he still has to survive so much shooting. There's, there's so much left here for Matt. Right, and those Molochs did go down in the center of the water there. That's going to be tough with only two two fighting units left for Pat. Three, if you include the Blood Mask, to, uh, to do anything in the center of the board. Yeah. Does look like he's going to take a temporary stand and just sit right on top of it with a character that does prevent units from picking it up. That'll that'll prevent them from picking it up on their uh, on their initial move. They will have to uh, to kill that individual. An overrun could potentially grab the token as well. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, no reason to to just completely give it up. You know, Pat should make Matt work for it if he can. Oh yeah. So. 
it does look like he is going to try and pop. He got a flank here with the Molochs on Nomagrak. Nomagrak. But I don't see like once that once Nomagrak dies, there's so many units around to capitalize. That that spot is just definitely very precarious. And that's right. that's being a little conservative there. Looks like he's putting the remaining shooting onto the chariots, backing those flame bearers out. Ooh. Um, good roll. Looks like he did quite a bit of damage there. Interestingly, Oh, yeah. they didn't even get wavered. And keep in mind that that Abyssal Warlock is an individual, so those chariots could overrun into the flame barriers on a combat. I don't even know if that will matter, because those Molochs, if they... Well, he's he probably is going to get this kill. Well, yeah, there we go. And that'll, that'll potentially prevent... Any flanks. We'll see here how he ends up positioning. And yeah, that there would prevent the uh, the flame bearers from being hit by the overrun on the warlock. And that's really what matters most right now is he's he has to get those last that last token and hold it. Pat was able to take up the take up the boomers on the right hand side of the board there. So the Cronius is still still there, still a threat to be dealt with. Matt certainly has the shooting to do that. But it's not uh, entirely over on the right side of the board. Yeah. If if it's going to come down to these last couple combats, if he pops those Molochs this turn, if those Flame Bearers can, can get out of dodge, if the Cronius can... I mean, and, and if, if Matt rolls a turn 7, there's no way. So Pat's, Pat's playing for turn 6. Here comes the... Uh... The heroes of the game, the Red Goblin Scouts flanking the Flame Bearers up there in the water. <laughs> yep. They they have snuck around, survived being shot. They've gotten crossed half the board. It's an exciting time to be a goblin. <laughs> they may not get eaten when the battle's over. The boomers are choosing to shoot the believe looks like a shot onto the harbinger only got a waiver on them so that's interesting here in the sixth turn of the game if there's no seven then that's one that pat has successfully kept out of matt's hands probably the best he could hope for at this point on that side of the board yep so at least forced a draw Again, all all determined by that turn seven roll here, but and that's how that's how don't you know you've had a really good game. Don't count out the flank of those goblins; they could still take it there in the center. It's it's true, you know. <laughs> I I too often fear being flanked by goblins. Positionally, bringing in the goblins, though, now that the Molochs are gone. They actually stopped that chariot horde from overrunning into the flame bearers, so maybe bringing them in was not the best idea. Yeah, I don't know if Matt expected those Molochs to to disappear quite as fast that way, so maybe he was just trying to play it extra safe, but it ended up backfiring in this case. Because yeah, it looks like those goblins they did bounce, they did some wounds, but those flame bearers are still there, still holding a token. We'll give them a. Uh... Uh, a pat on the back to those to those goblins for doing the the six wounds well hindered. Yeah, valiant effort. Quite quite impressive. So, it looks like we have the uh, the remaining Cronius able to get engaged with one of the warlocks and see if he can get a uh, one more unit before he's shot off the table, most likely. Really, it depends. It depends on a on a turn seven on what Matt wants to do with regards to this side of the board. It does look like the flame bears. Those flame bears were wavered last turn, correct? The ones on the left. The ones on the left with the one damage were wavered previously. It looks like they're able to act normally this turn. Yeah. So that will be uh, quite a shot that they get to take here. 
see if they can get lucky enough to take out the mammoth potentially. I don't know that they have many other options. There's the boomer sergeant in the in the grass there. Yeah. Uh, but they do shoot and do three damage to the uh, to the mammoth. Yeah, I was gonna say if that if I I think that was the the warlock actually fireball. Oh, three damage with the warlock fireball. That's that's yeah. actually great. Yeah, six total from the flame bears as well. It's possible that that they take down that mammoth. Yeah. Looking for a twelve at the moment to get rid of him. So does does look like he stuck around just by the skin of his teeth. But that Heliquin's coming in for the back of the chariots, and if he can, he can set it up to try to keep his turn four dream as alive as possible. <laughs> I can't. Looks like he was able to do. Looks like he was able to do a single wound to the chariots. Doesn't look like they were able to get picked up. Did he drop the loot token from the flame bears? Okay. Does possibly not appear just that he a, did so. Yeah. yeah, possibly just a reposition. Uh, you know, with using universal battle, sometimes you have to kind of go back and clean up some of those things. So it does look like that Pat rolled in a turn seven. They've they have yeah. stated that they rolled to see what double ones could be rolled by Matt. And it looks like he did not overrun enough to quite get the token from underneath the from the harbinger over there on the right hand side. Yeah. So But the chariots means... were able to get the the chariots and probably the mammoth in there were able to get the job done and take that uh that central token for the flame bears. Oh yeah. So it looks like a uh, two to one over uh, I'm sorry, two zero over to Matt. Yep, it did come down to that last turn though. Yeah, so after that game was played, it does look like it was a good win for Matt. I do like his strategy of keep of dedicating just enough to take that left token. And that way he didn't have to worry as much about winning the center. And it does show because he only needed to he only really needed to take that central token and that right hand token. And it shows he didn't focus on it for most of the game. He just sent the siege breakers and the boomers, and that was all he needed to keep Pat from securing it himself. Right, positionally, uh, Matt was in a very strong, strong uh, initial setup on the left-hand side of the board there, and he definitely took advantage of that. Uh, those those flame bears getting the ability to uh, to recover their wounds like they do is is really fantastic. Uh, the one on the, the ones on the left there took well into double digits in damage and damage and did the game with only a wound on them. Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. So yeah. I do like the new. Abyssal Warlocks that got shown off in this game. I think those are pretty crazy and how they change positioning on a lot of things. Right. They, they did do very well um, to, to support that shooting. Um, they were definitely a factor in the game. Um, I think the game really, really changed when those, uh, the, the regiment of cavalry that were swinging around the right hand side for Pat were, were picked up uh, on a very good roll from those boomers. Yeah, no, that was, that was huge. The, the, that regiment being picked up was huge. I do think I do think it was still the right call to make that full swing around. I don't think that coming in a little bit earlier would have worked. He needed to threaten that flank hard. And that was the only way he was going to peel off those units. Right. I agree that, that was that, that was probably the right move and and had they not um taken enough damage to be wavered or anything like that, that's something oh, that... uh that, that Matt really would have had to uh to worry about over there once they got into those boomers in combat. Yeah, that that would have been a completely different game. I I don't know. I do agree that if those succubus had stayed back, succubi had stayed back, that the that loot token would have been a bit more safe. But I don't know if he would have been able to hold out as long in the center without them, because that would have been another siege breaker unit up, and they were soaking up a lot of the firepower. So yeah, they were. They were they were helpful enough in combat, but I I think that they are so strong defensively that once they secured that token, and if they were able to get back into the woods, then really it just right. becomes a battle over that central token. So I, I I don't know that risking them was the right play, but that side of the board didn't go the way that uh, I think Pat expected it to early on. Mm -hmm. um, again, coming back to those cavalry getting picked up, so maybe there was a little pressure there to to kind of make something yeah. happen on that side of the board. 
yeah, I was I was curious maybe if he had dropped the token before he came over the hill. That way it would have been because it would have still been way back there at this point. It would have been difficult to get around everything. But that's true. Um, yeah, but dropping that ended the token. Up not mattering because it was still he, Matt was still unable to actually claim it after all was said and done. So. Right, right. But I, I see what you mean about potentially dropping that token on, on Pat's own side of the hill. Uh, there wasn't a lot of speed on that side of the board from Matt, so that may have been a safer play if he was going to commit the succubi. Yeah. All in all, though, pretty amazing game. Do do think it came down. It came down like all good games do to that, that turn seven roll. And so between a draw and a and a loss for, for Pat and a win for Matt, Two uh two very good players, and we will get to see uh see Matt um, playing at Masters next month, February twenty um, third and twenty fourth. All right, guys, thanks for joining us today with this wonderful battle report. I've been Matt Carmack. This has been Mike Piercy. We will be casting live at the Masters event on the twenty third and twenty fourth. I'm gonna hand it back over to Matt Young. Wow, guys, so that was a match. Um, I, I've never beaten this guy before. He always <laughs> kicks my ass, so I'm really excited today that I at least got something. You saw the ogres that I have. Yeah, those I, boomers, they just made, they just ruined my day. I love I love what they did, that the RC. So Jeff Swan, Daniel King, um, Christopher James. I don't remember who all is on the RC. I, I'm forgetting some people I know, but thank you. Mammoths are amazing. Boomers are ne never stopped being But amazing. now they're piercing two. We're Bane Chant five. And, potentially and drain life like eight like every time drain not, life eight it's not so that it good. worked out for you in this game oh but. that's true it doesn't it doesn't matter i mean they're still too good i have so much shooting now yeah, war, warlocks are are going to be replacing boomer sergeants I think. <laughs> I think they're so good anyway so that's what the game's going to look like um pat tell us more about it tell us when masters is what what's going yeah, on masters is the february 23rd and 24th we will be streaming it live um it's going to be on my channel which um i'll We'll put the link in the description. Sure. Look down and, below, it'll be there. And I'll share it to Facebook and Fanatics and all that. Um, and then afterwards, you know, we'll archive it. So if you can't catch it live, you can watch it later. Uh, we have many sponsors, Hobby Sauce included, um, as well as Mantic, RGD Gaming, Lady of the Lake, Lone Wolf, um, and a bunch of people. The uh, Committee Against Elves is sponsoring it from the Southeast. Um, and we have a uh, a bunch of people came from the community who came in to sponsor the master stream as well. Did they only allow commit? Did they only allow their sponsorship if elves weren't streamed? Was that a rule? Uh, yeah, they have some uh, anti-elf views that you know we don't exactly yeah can condone, but. <laughs> Doesn't bother me. I, I don't play. You don't see them much down here in the south. No, no. I, it, I'm expecting them at Masters. Yeah, yeah. It's Texas, though. Not many people play elves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again, Pat. Really appreciated having you on. Great playing you. Um, we met today because we're just at. We, we, we met so that we could shoot this little bit, but uh, we played on Universal Battle. I will be at Masters as well. Um, I'm the like ninth ninth runner in our state, but Pat dropped out to stream, so I actually made Masters. Uh, don't expect to do much, but I'm going to be there at least. Uh, so, I think you got a pretty good list. I think I think you're going to be one of my dark horse picks. I, I appreciate a dark horse <laughs> pick. I don't think I can beat some of those people, but I'll give them a try. I like playing anybody. So um, anyway, guys, uh, there we go. I hope you all are excited about Masters. I hope you all are going to come or watch Masters, watch the stream if you're not coming because it's going to be really cool. You're going to see the absolute top people in Kings of War playing each other. These will be the tightest, best games you'll you'll ever see. I mean, definitely the, the most strategic games you'll ever see. You'll see it with commentary, just like you were watching it on ESPN, and with people who know what they're talking about, because Pat's going to be watching it over. Michael Piercy is going to be doing it. He qualified for Masters and dropped as well for it. He won two tournaments this year. I absolutely first pick overall in two tournaments this year, and mm -hmm. Matt Carmack has been in the game for a really long time too. So it's going to be some really top-level commentary. Hopefully what you saw today proves that. So awesome, guys. Uh, we'll see you there, and until then, stay saucy. Happy sauce.